In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Earlier today, at the Matin service, and at the pre-sanctified liturgy, we chanted that we have completed the 40-day fast. From the beginning of the fast to today has been 40 days. And we ask the Lord to deem us worthy to go to Bethany, to behold Lazarus, to be among those who are the chosen of the Lord, not the hypocrites who said, Hosanna in the highest, and then out of the same mouth said, away with him, away with him, crucify him. But we pray to be among those who are the faithful, the followers of Jesus Christ, the only God, the source of all good things, the source of life, who says, I am the life and I am the resurrection. <clears throat> and it is meet now that after we finish the 40-day fast, that we go up to Bethany and we behold Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus, which prefigured the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. This is extremely significant because it's, because it's not just an event. It is a lesson for all of us, for we know that whosoever partakes of this cup or of this bread partakes of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It means that we also must pick up our cross and that we also have to see parallels in our lives with that of the life of Jesus Christ if we are to be true servants. So the day before we begin the fast to today and Holy Friday, we have a close link and we need to make that connection. We need to stress that today. The very day before we begin Great Lent, we commemorate the banishment of Adam and Eve from paradise. Adam and Eve heard the voice of the serpent. Eve accepted the voice of the serpent. When the serpent spoke to Eve and she accepted his voice, the venom of the serpent, which is venomous, went into her and her mind became twisted. It was not the same. She was not the same person. And as it often happens, when a person becomes twisted, he loses his peace. And so he needs to pass on that venom to another. So in disobeying God and in obeying the serpent, and after partaking of the tree, she felt shame. She noticed that she was naked. She went to Adam and passed on that venom to Adam. And Adam also partook of this tree, being fooled by the words, as we said, of the serpent. And as we hear in the hymnology of the church, comely to behold and good for eating was the fruit that slew me. Christ is the true fruit. Christ is the tree of life. And they partook of this fruit and they lost. They were so fooled. They were told that they would become like God if they had partaken of this fruit, but they already were like God, as we said. They were made in the image and likeness of God. Herein is the irony, herein is the folly of listening to the voice of the devil. Oftentimes we have it made, we have blessings, and he fools us to believe that those blessings which are in front of us are actually not good for us, or that the venom which is in front of us is better for us. Fools. And that's what happens when we listen to the voice of the evil one. And we know from the teachings of the fathers that the very beginning of sin is a suggestion, that the devil suggests something to us. 
That is not a sin in and of itself. It only becomes a sin when we listen. And when we listen to the thought which he suggests, we give him authority over our thoughts to the point where we get dizzy or we almost feel like we're losing our minds because there's a whole tornado of thoughts going on. We know there's something wrong. We've lost peace. And yet we're stuck because we don't know the way of escape. We don't know how to get out of it. We got too deep. Let us not fool ourselves and think that this is okay. Let us not look for any other solution to this problem but Jesus Christ himself. There's no way we're going to get out of it until we humble ourselves and go to him and say, I have sinned. Because if Adam and Eve did that, they would have been redeemed. They didn't go to God to confess their fault, so God went to them. God comes down to us. He comes to our level. He became a man for us. And so he said, Adam, where are you? And Adam did not ask for forgiveness for disobeying God. One commandment was given to him. And that one commandment, even that one commandment was disobeyed. Did you perhaps partake of the tree? Of course, God knows all things, as we heard in today's canon. When our Lord said, where have you laid Lazarus? He knew. And God started trying to give the remedy. He also spoke to Adam. Because the opposite happens with the voice of God. Goodness comes out. Power comes out. The energy of God comes out of his mouth. Every word which is spoken by God is grace. But Adam did not get enlightened because he was confused. He was in a very dark place. You remember the quote that I read from St. Macarius. The whole world is in disarray and people don't know why. They don't understand that it's because of this, that venom which entered into the race of man, which has really messed up our thoughts. This is why the fathers say, don't trust your thoughts. Because we don't realize how much he's gotten in there. And this is why the fathers of the church always prayed for enlightenment so they can be delivered from this evil, this sick condition of mankind. Sometimes one person may think, oh, I'm beyond help. Well, he doesn't understand this whole lesson, that only in God can we find healing. We will be lost, not just during our life, but for eternity, if we don't go to the right source to be healed of this malady which each and every one of us, to a lesser or to a greater degree, has. And so, God, in his righteous judgment, banished Adam from paradise because they could not remain in paradise under such circumstances. Paradise could not be defiled. Evil could not be in paradise. These men need to work hard in order to get back to the original image and likeness of God. And so they were banished from paradise. And with this sin and with this banishment came death. There would have been no death, for we know from scriptures that the wages of sin is death. Death entered into the world because of this sin. God did not leave man in such a condition because in his righteous judgment, he also has great mercy. And this is one of the things we always conclude our hymns with, Tomegaeleos, the great mercy of God. We ask for the great mercy of God continuously. The Jesus prayer is about the mercy of God. We are in search of God's mercy. 
if we know what's best for us. None of us can be illuminated, none of us can receive grace unless we give ourselves to God and find out and understand where the source of the healing is and where the source of life is, because all of us will come to death. There is only one thing that is sure and certain for all of us, we will all die. So what's the point? Why are we amassing riches? Why are we so stuck in the world? We are going to die. And this is, these are the wages of sin. In his mercy then, God did not leave man forever in such a state. But he, in his pre-eternal counsel, his counsel from before the ages, for God knew what would be. Since God is the all-knowing, omnipotent God, He's the only one that can behold the entire world and the entire universe and know every single detail about every single person or creation at the same time, past, present, and future. Only God. And so in his divine plan, he devised this way to save mankind. He could have chosen any possible way to redeem us, but we can't even figure out the wisdom, the greatness of the wisdom of God. He knows why man could be redeemed only by this way. But also, he shows us that greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. He humbles himself and he becomes a man. Now we must understand this is God before the ages before whom the angels tremble because of the greatness of his glory, the majesty of which cannot be expressed. And he hides his divinity in his humanity. When the prophets had audience before God, they were astonished and were amazed and were in awe and were humbled. When we come into communion with God, we humble ourselves. How many people take communion in such a proud way? They have not taken God deeply into their hearts. So our Lord <clears throat> humbled himself, became a man. He hid his Godhead in man. He humbled himself so much to the point of the cross. First of all, it was a great thing that he humbled himself. He came down to our nature. In other words, the creator becomes his creation. He didn't make a point of telling anybody, do you know who I am? He didn't go around talking about how great he was. In fact, the only great one, the greatest of the greatest, God, the creator. And yet we're stuck in trying to prove how great we are. And so he humbled himself and he made sure that he was born in a cave and in a manger in a very humble way, in an insignificant way, among the brute beasts. And these are the things which we need to contemplate. Now I'm speaking to you about these things, but we need to study them and contemplate them in an enlightened fashion because the depth of this knowledge is beyond our comprehension, as we said. So our Savior takes upon himself this form. He becomes his own creature. And then he lives this life working miracles. He was quiet pretty much up until he was 30 years old. And then he gathered his disciples, and then he started working great miracles. And as St. Simeon, the God receiver, said, this child shall be for the rising or for the fall of many people. It's very significant because many people came into this communication with God and fell. They weren't enlightened. They couldn't take it. They became their own gods. They became idolaters. They didn't want anybody else to take the place of themselves. 
And so this is what we see now. Plenty of these Pharisees saw so many of the miracles of our Lord Jesus Christ, but couldn't take it. The same thing happens throughout the generations with every holy person, with the saints. Crucify him, the enemies would say. How many, as we said, of these hypocritical people would say, Hosanna in the highest, save us, O God, in the highest. And just a few days later would say, away with him, crucify him. So we heard about that sin which Adam committed in paradise, and now we see that Jesus Christ becomes the new Adam. This is why we have to understand this whole concept of the old man and the new man. The old man is Adam in sin, and the new man is Jesus Christ, who becomes a man for our sake. He becomes a man in all ways except for sin, which means he was like Adam at the beginning in his manhood. Then our Lord needed to redeem us. And so just as Adam and Eve were fooled in paradise, so was the devil fooled on Holy and Great Friday. Because the devil, after seeing this great miracle of Lazarus, started influencing his servants to crucify him. At this point, of course, he, he wanted to get rid of him for a while, but at this point, it was the point of no return. They were going mad. They had to get rid of this Jesus Christ, this great prophet. And although the devil had an idea, he didn't exactly know what was awaiting him. He didn't know what was going to happen. So here now our Savior works this awesome miracle, prefiguring his own resurrection, and he raises Lazarus from the dead. And tomorrow we're going to hear the beautiful gospel passage, which is so moving to so many Christians. And in it we find <coughs> that Jesus wept. And the fathers teach us that he didn't just weep because he was emotional. He wept, of course, because... In his weeping, he showed that he was a human being. And in the resurrection, he showed that he was God. But he wept because in the person of Lazarus, he saw all of us. He saw Adam before his fall. And he said, what has man come to? Man has come to this point where he stinks. He had such glory in paradise, and now he comes to this point where he's dead, he dies, he stinks. And the gates of paradise are closed since the fall of Adam. And so Jesus wept over our condition. What a pitiful condition. Sometimes somebody who's a little more spiritually alert looks at someone who's not so spiritually alert, and he pities him. Can you imagine God himself looking down from heaven at all of us, how pitiful we must be in his eyes, how off we must be in his eyes, so ignorant, so unenlightened. We have to understand these things. Because of the great miracle of Lazarus, many believed on him, and the Jews and the Pharisees said, what are we going to do? He's working so many miracles. Can you imagine the foolishness of these people? They weren't enlightened by his miracles. They wanted to get rid of him because of his miracles, because he censured them, because he put them in, in their place. See how bad it is for us when we do not receive correction. By doing and by acting in such a way, we're fighting God. And we can find ourselves in the same place as these Pharisees who rejected God because God challenged them. And so they were so foolish, so, so foolish, that they thought that they could get rid of God before the ages to quiet him so that they could live their comfortable lives. 
is the epitome of stupidity. But people do that even now. These things are written so that we can know that the same thing happens now. And as I said at the beginning of this sermon, we need to see the parallels in our own lives. Some believed on him, many believed on him. Some went and re reported the issue, the whole matter of the resurrection of Lazarus, to the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees were quite upset. You remember the miracle of the blind man who had no eyes and they kept asking him. And then finally they expelled him from the synagogue as if they could expel anyone. God himself received the blind man and gave him eyes and gave him spiritual eyes. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And by the end of the miracle, our Savior says to those whom he healed, dost thou believe in the Son of God? Who is he, Lord, that I may believe? I am he. So he corrected the prayer, Jesus, son of David, to Jesus, son of God, dost thou believe in the Son of God? And this is, as we said, the Jesus prayer that we say even now. The next day, because of this great miracle, many of the people were so enthusiastic because they were waiting for the king. They were waiting for their redemption. They were thinking in worldly terms. Many were thinking in worldly terms. Those are the ones that couldn't get it. So they were ethnophilitic. They wanted to have their own kingdom, Israel, because they understood the prophets literally, and they thought that Jesus could be the king of Israel who would redeem them and would set up the kingdom of Israel. And so they thought, here we have a king. They forgot, or they did not realize at all what we said earlier, that one thing is sure, we are all going to die. And Jesus Christ is the eternal king. In the person of Lazarus, we should meditate upon death, something that I've been saying now for years, the remembrance of death, something that the Holy Fathers teach us, the remembrance of death in a healthy manner to understand that we will die. It could be any time. So these people cried out on the streets, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And our Lord is on the foal of an ass, and he's coming in on this humble animal to be slaughtered. At this time, everything seems great, but in a few days, they crucify him. How is it that our Savior Jesus Christ fooled Satan? On the night of his crucifixion, After his death, which he accepted in obedience to his father, he accepted to die in order to make all things new. Or rather, let's point out that before his death, he went up on the tree in order to heal us of the malady which came from that tree of old, which Adam partook of. And now Jesus Christ is the fruit of the tree of life, the cross. He healed us of that malady. And his blood from the cross drenched the earth from which we were taken. We were created when he took clay of the earth and made us and formed us. And now that form, that earth, is sanctified by his very blood. Then in his soul, our Lord goes down to Hades. Thou didst descend into the nethermost parts of the earth, katilthes and tis katotatis tis gis, in order to free the souls there. Innumerable souls, many, many souls. And before his coming, John the Baptist went down to Hades and preached 
the Messiah is coming. As he preached on earth, he also preached in Hades, the Messiah is coming. And as a free gift from God, all of those souls who accepted Jesus Christ were freed from the tyranny of Hades and were saved. Adam and Eve, of course, being the first. There are many stories concerning some of the Greek philosophers, even. Many accepted our Lord Jesus Christ. There were few that could not, because their state was too dark. They could not see that light. They could not accept that light. They were too dark. And so, of course, this is cause of great celebration. Holy Saturday, on the, the divine liturgy of Holy Saturday, what a great celebration that is. This is what we remember. The Protianastasi, the first resurrection. Our Lord goes down into Hades, and he comes up and reunites with his body and arises from the dead and raises us all up and opens the gates of paradise. Adam and Eve are freed. Death is put to death, and we were brought to life. And that is what happens on the Holy Feast of Pascha. God could have chosen any way to redeem us, but he chose this way, because greater love hath no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. And I have called you my friends. Look at the humility of Jesus Christ. God calls us as friends. A few days ago we read in the homilies of St. Macarius, Know thy dignity, O man. Wake up. God wants you to be his friend for eternity. Do you know what that means? God did all this for you, and it's not right for the Christian to be lazy. While God performed all these acts for us, to the point of death, to the point of being crucified in the most humiliating way. Know thy dignity, O man. Thy clay is now united to the blood of Jesus Christ. Know thy dignity, O man, says St. Macarius. Now we've become gods by grace, greater than what Adam was before the fall. Now we begin a greater gift, that we are participants in the body and blood of Christ, we can become gods by grace. And the Archeon Carlos, the ancient beauty, comes back to us. Know thy dignity, O man. God did all this for you. And can you not do a little bit of struggle for your own self? He did it for you. You have to struggle for yourself too. You're not struggling for him. He doesn't need your struggle. He doesn't need your incense. He doesn't need your candles. But we're the ones that need to light the candles and to burn the incense before him. We're the, need, we're the ones that need to go on our knees. I was telling someone earlier today, do you know how significant even the prayer, Cateftincito, let my prayer be set forth. Why are we all on our knees? Because, because of our sins, we don't have any great boldness. But at that moment, God gives us a little more boldness so that our prayers can ascend with the incense. That's why the prayer says, let my prayer be set forth as incense. But we're spiritually stupid. We have a hard time making connections with things. May God give us illumination. Let us connect now with all these things and understand the par these, these parallels that we're talking about so that this week we can have a great and holy week in truth, humbling our hearts so that we understand what we're doing when we go on our knees. We're worshiping the one God. It's not just some type of a exercise alone. We are going on our knees to worship God. We go on our knees, but then we come back up. We are raised up together with Jesus Christ. We have fallen into sin, and that's the significance of the prostration. 
but Jesus Christ himself can raise us up. And that's the significance of our rising, raising ourselves up after the prostration. Know thy dignity, O man. Know that God wishes that you be with him in paradise forever. Let us all pray that our Lord Jesus Christ deem us worthy to be among those faithful servants who truly worshiped him. Let us pray that he never abandon us because if he abandons us, we abandon him. We need his grace to be able to be true worshipers of him, the one God in Trinity. Then we will truly be raised together with him. Then we will truly be his servants. Then we will truly be his friends. May our Lord deem us worthy to stand by his cross as faithful servants this Holy Friday. May he deem us worthy to listen to the Nymphio services, the bridegroom services, which tell us Thy bridal chamber do I behold, all adorned, but a garment I don't have, so that I may enter therein, because at that time, whenever there was a wedding, everybody had to have a special garment. So we see his wedding feast, but we don't have a garment, so we need the garment from him. It's a gift from him. Illumine the garment of my soul, O light restore and save me. We ask our Savior at that ex apostillarium. Before the cross, uh, before the resurrection comes the cross, and behold, through the cross, joy has come to the whole world. Forever blessing the Lord, let us all praise his resurrection. May we all be deemed worthy to celebrate the feast of St. Lazarus, which prefigures the feast of the resurrection of Christ, and may we be deemed worthy to celebrate that feast, the very feast of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, both in, the, both in this life and the age to come. Amen.